Welcome to today's MIT STAR Forum. Thank you so much for being with us here today. We're so glad to see that people from across the world are interested in this subject and that you have taken the time to attend. My name is Ada Petrichka and I will have the pleasure of moderating this panel. I'm a journalist and foreign correspondent from Poland. I cover human rights and social justice currently for the New York Times. I also serve as the Elizabeth Neufer Fellow at the International Women Media Foundation. And as part of my fellowship, I conducted research at the, at the MIT Center for International Studies. And I was also a member of the editorial board of the Boston Globe. We're here today to discuss the state of media freedom in Russia, Poland, and Hungary. But before we get started, I'd like to share some housekeeping notes. First, I would like to thank our sponsor, the MIT Center for International Studies. I also would like to point out to our viewers that we will have a Q&A session at the end of the talk. So please find the Q&A feature on the bottom of your toolbar. This is where you can type in your questions and we will hopefully get to as many of them as possible. In addition, please pay attention to the chat feature also on the bottom of the toolbar where we will be sending our resources, any bios, upcoming events or other information that may be of interest to you in the future. And now let me introduce to you our experts and also the subject of our debate. When in October last year, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to two veteran journalists, Maria Ressa from the Philippines and Dmitry Muratov from Russia, the global journalist community welcomed this news with both excitement, but also unease. Because the last time a working journalist received this award was in the 1930s and the recipient, the German editor and, and anti-war activist Karl von Oschetzky was incarcerated in a Nazi concentration camp and he never regained his freedom. So I think many of us felt that this time, once again, the award signals a very dangerous time for press freedom. Across the world, journalists face censorship, restrictive legislation, harassment, jail, and in most extreme cases, even death. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, 274 journalists were imprisoned for their work in 2020, which is a record number since 1992. Europe remains the safest place to practice journalism in, but even there, the press freedom rankings indicate a growing crisis. And this is especially true of the central and eastern part of the continent. During our debate, we will be presenting three case studies, the stories of the assaults on media freedom in Russia, Hungary, and Poland. They are distinct study, stories, but at the same time, they seem to follow similar patterns, which we will try to pinpoint and so dissect the anatomy of an autocratic assault on freedom of press. In order to do that, we will examine authoritarian tools and mechanisms. And finally, we will offer recommendations for democratic actions against these attempts. In all, three, in all three countries examined, the state of media freedom has significantly deteriorated over the past decade. In Russia, it is of, of course by far the most dire. Ranked at 150 in the World Press Freedom Index, Russia is the most dangerous place in Europe to practice journalism in. In a way, when we examine the state of freedom press in Russia, we can perhaps lurk into the future of many countries worldwide. The case of Russia will be presented by Valerie Hopkins, the, the New York Times Moscow correspondent. Until recently, Valerie was the Southeast Europe correspondent for the Financial Times based in Budapest. Before that, she spent a decade covering the Balkans. Her work has also appeared in The Guardian, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Foreign Policy, Mother Jones, Political jo uh, sorry, Mother, Mother Jones, Political Europe, and elsewhere. She has an MA in journalism from Columbia University and a BA in international relations from the College of William and Mary. Our second case study will be Hungary, which is not as far on the authoritarian route, but it is following suit. At the 82nd rank in the World Press Freedom Index, the situation of independent media in the country is extremely challenging. There's no better person to tell the story than Veronica Monk, the founding editor-in-chief and head of con content development at one of the few remaining independent media outlets in Hungary, Telex. Previously, she was a, the deputy editor-in-chief at Index Online News Daily, where she has worked for over 18 years, until she quit in July 2020 with her 80 plus colleagues because practicing independent journalism was no longer possible at that media outlet. 
Veronica has a media studies PhD and teaches university on um, and teaches courses on journalism at Elta University, the largest Hungarian university. The third case study today will be Poland, which is the last which is the last of the countries to take the authoritarian trajectory. Until in, until the law and justice rose to power in 2015, the country was a safe haven to practice journalists to practice journalism in because it ranked 18th in the World Press Freedom Index. Ever since then, it has noted one of the sharpest declines reported, and today is ranked at 64th. The case of Poland will be recounted by media freedom expert and lawyer Paulina Milewska. Paulina is a senior advisor for the European Center for Press and Media Freedom. She is currently a PhD researcher at the European Univers University Institute in Florence and fellow of the German Marshall Fund Rethink CE program. Previously, she has worked for the leading quality newspaper in Poland, Gazeta Wyborcza. She has also served as a board member for various NGOs. So let me welcome our first speaker, Valerie Hopkins. Hi. Hi, everyone. Greetings from Moscow. Um, thank you very much for, for having me on this panel. Thank you, Ada, for inviting me to be on this discussion. It's a big honor to be here with Veronica, whose outlet Telex was such a valuable source of information to me uh, while I was working in Hungary for the Financial Times. And it's, it's, it, I think it deserves a lot of applause for being such an independent and impartial outlet at a time when the media scene in Hungary is so polarized and there's so much official um, distrust, shall we say, of, of independent media. I'm also grateful to be here with Polina, whose systemic analysis of the media landscape in Central Eastern Europe has informed mine very much. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. And, um, you know, plus, I think this is the first all-female panel I've ever been on. So thank you, Ada, for that. Um, I'm a journalist, so I want to start with the headlines. Um, I just finished, I don't even think it's been published yet, on the New York Times website, writing a story about how Russia's foreign ministry decided today to effectively ban Germany's uh, state-sponsored Deutsche Welle outlet, which broadcasts here in Russian, English, and German. Uh, the move was taken in retaliation uh, against Germany's media regulator, uh, which banned yesterday, or on, I think on Tuesday, the satellite transmission of RT Deutsch, um, which it said was banned because they had not gone through the pro appropriate procedures for registering themselves legally, uh, which is not the case, of course, for RT Deutsch, I believe. I mean, sorry, for um, Deutsche Welle here in Russia, which I believe has gone through all of the proper and appropriate legal channels uh, to be here and has been operating here since the early 2000s. Um, we still don't know how many people this will affect on the ground, but it means 144 million Russians are probably going to lose access to the high quality radio TV content that Deutsche Welle produces. And it's just uh, the latest sort of step against independent international media uh, here operating here in Russia. Um, I was talking to some of my Russian journalist friends while I was preparing for this panel and, uh, you know, trying to get from them, what are some of the big benchmarks? Um, when did we really see a lot of deterioration? And, you know, one of them just said three words, it was Putin. Um, so I do think that, that we can say that media freedom has been an issue since Putin came to power in 2000. Um, current estimates are that more than 20 journalists have been killed in Russia since he came. But, you know, until basically a year and a half ago, I mean, there are different, there are different opinions on this, but uh, another local, uh, another Russian co journalist colleague based here said that, you know, until about last summer, it was kind of a cat and mouse game. One outlet was forced to close, but its reporters reconstituted themselves elsewhere and founded a new outlet. Um, yes, there was a very big crackdown in 2014 that coincided with Russia's annexation of Crimea. Um, but what we've seen in the past year and a half has just been kind of relentless. As I said, you know, we happen to have this discussion today and I have something to report about it to you. Um, you know, some people have tied that to, to what we witnessed in Belarus and to, in the August to, after the August 2000 presidential elections, this kind of big outpouring of support for the Belarusian opposition um, and followed by not only a crackdown in Belarus, but a crackdown here in Russia. Um, that's also extended to foreign media. Um, in addition to this 
announced revocation of Deutsche Welle's journalist accreditation. Um, the Russian foreign ministry said they would stop all the satellite broadcasts. They would initiate procedures to name Deutsche Welle journalists foreign, foreign agents, which I'll talk about in a bit for those of you that don't know uh, what that is. Um, and they also said they would create a list of, of people who were involved in um, removing RT Deutsche's license and ban them from coming to Russia. Um, but this isn't the first time um, we saw in August of last year, Russia kicked out a, a BBC journalist who had spent almost half of her life studying or loving Russia uh, and reporting in it. Um, and also in November, a Dutch journalist. Um, every Friday evening, people are sitting on their computers, reloading the Russian Ministry of Justice's website, looking to find out who's been named a foreign agent. Uh, this goes to, a two, this is about a 2012 law that in 2017 was extended as well to journalists, um, and then in 2019 also to individuals, um, that essentially labels these people what is effectively an enemy of state. So they are subject to very onerous requirements of, of how they spend their money, uh, where their money comes from. Uh, and they also, you know, it can be something as arbitrary at one media outlet, the editor of one media outlet, Republic, recently posted on Twitter that he found out that his outlet was named a foreign agent because some foreign embassies subscribed, paid, had paid subscriptions, and so did the Wall Street Journal. So it can be incredibly arbitrary, but it comes with a very heavy burden. Um, so Deutsche Welle, if they do get added to this register of foreign agents, will join uh, Voice of America, which was the first foreign agent uh, to be named in 2017, first media foreign agent, sorry. Um, and they'll also join Radio Liberty, which was named in 2020. Um, I think it's also important, you know, just to mention, at least if we're talking about a wider crackdown on, on journalists, this also extends to civil society organizations in Russia. Um, one of the most important stories that I covered last year was the court ordered liquidation of the court ordering a liquidation of Memorial, um, which is a very, one of the first and most prominent civil society organizations here, human rights organizations. It's, it's an archive of Soviet repression and Stalin, especially the Stalinist era Gulag repressions, but it's also um, you know, a human rights organization that advocates today for human rights and files important appeals before the European Court of Human Rights, et cetera. Um, many of the people I spoke to. So, so, so it's not only a crackdown on journalists, but it's also a crackdown on organizations that often provide a lot of the research or information that, that journalists need and use. So Memorial, for instance, was, uh, is, a, is a major supporter of another organization called Ovide Info, which is the only source of truly impartial um, accounting of how many people attend protests, get arrested at them, et cetera. Something, stuff that's important for us to do our jobs. Um, as, as the Nobel Prize laureate who Ada mentioned in her talk, Dmitry Muratov put it in his Nobel speech in December, as governments continually improve the past, journalists are trying to improve the future. Um, I, as Ada mentioned, I'm very newly arrived in Russia and I really want to tip my hat to the incredible journalists here. You know, there's often this blanket, um, how can I describe it? Blanket statements, I guess, about countries, autocratic countries. I remember um, at the beginning of the pandemic when I was in Hungary and um, Hungary's parliament gave sweeping powers to Viktor Orban. I went on Fried Zakaria and he was like, there's no media, you know, Orban has trampled over all of it, you know, and, I, and I've heard people say the same thing about Putin. And actually what I really want to stress in this panel is that there are incredible, brave individuals, not only Murantov, but so many people um, who are working to do impartial journalism in, in, at, a, at a time when, you know, they're being attacked as enemies and not rising to take the bait. We've seen this also in America, I should be fair. Um, so I would like to express my solidarity with them and my deep appreciation to them for helping me to understand this country that I'm still trying to understand. Um, and I think just, but, but the problem is, you know, they, these journalists are so brave. They spend so much time working. They take a lot of deep personal risks. Um, 
And they're doing it in a situation where they don't have equal access to the, shall we say, the media market or to the market of public opinion. I was taking the train to St. Petersburg where I celebrated New Year's just after Christmas, three weeks after Dmitry Muratov um, presented his Nobel lecture to rapturous applause um, in Oslo. And, you know, a woman came by on the super deluxe uh, Sapsan train, fast train to St. Petersburg with a whole bunch of newspapers. And um, my friend I was sitting with said, oh, do you have the Novaya, which means a new one. And she goes, they're all new. And he was like, yeah, I mean, Novaya Gazeta. And she just looked at him. She didn't know what it was, right? There, you know, the whole world is watching. And yet in Russia, a poll from the Levada Center, an independent uh, pollster, which is also a foreign agent, um, found that only a quarter of Russians had actually heard about this Nobel Prize. So it's not only um, about pressure, <laughs> it's not only about um, access to information, it's, it's also access to, to people, to having, to, having to, to viewers and readers. So um, I think, I'm, I'm, I know Ada has a lot of questions. I think I can get into some more specifics later, but I'm really in, eager to continue this discussion and, and hear about some of the similarities and some of the differences between Poland and Hungary. Thank you. Thank you so much, Valerie. And thank you for sharing your latest scoop. Um, and I would it's like- It's not a scoop, really. <laughs> it's, it's everywhere. It's, it's very sad. Um, yeah, but I would like to also um, draw attention, the attention of our audience to Valerie's latest story from Kazakhstan. It was featured on page one of the New York Times and it's really very strong, brilliant. Congratulations on that. Um, and let us move to our second speaker, Veronica Munk. Thank you, Adan. Thank you very much for, for inviting me uh, to the panel. And I'd also like to emphasize how happy I am to be in an all-female panel. It's, it's a first time for me as well. So <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Uh, yeah. Um, as we discussed that we're going to have a Q&A section and we have a, a longer discussion, I just would like to, to uh, talk a little bit about generally about the Hungarian media situation. Uh, you said it in your introduction and as an independent journalist who has worked in Hungary for two decades and who has a media studies PhD and who experienced the politically influenced takeover, I can assure you and the audience that the free press in Hungary is in a very bad shape. You cited the word press freedom index uh, which is a continuous decline, now ranks, I think, 92nd. And in 2006, it was the 10th place out of the list of 168 countries. And the only EU country ranking lower uh, is Bulgaria, while countries like Albania, Moldova, and North Macedonia are ahead of Hungary. Uh, when I... When I think through uh, how is the media situation in my country, I can differentiate five different important factors that shaped the Hungarian media in the last decade. Uh, and the first uh, and most important is that how the Hungarian media landscape has fractured into two distinct parts. One, the part is, uh, uh, includes the outlets, the media outlets, which have some kind of connection to the politics, to politicians uh, uh, in the government. And others, which is the minority part of the whole scene, uh, which are independent of the government. The second, uh, and, and, and this trend uh, that I mentioned, that this pro-Orban or pro-governmental media conglomerate uh, uh, is there the pi primary reason behind this trend that uh, uh, that the, the ownership structure uh, has changed in the media scene over the past decade, during which more and more independent media outlets fell into hands of business circles with close ties to the political elite. And it's worth stressing that these businesses did not act independently but as executors of an overreaching governmental strategy and their transactions were at the end of the day 
financed by taxpayer money. And over the past last 10 years, even ever more printed media, radio and TV stations were acquired by people with connections to politics and politicians. Uh, and this pro-governmental media conglomerate is organized. They had basically infinite resources versus the critical media sphere that is mostly only online, is underfinanced, fragmented, and sometimes competing with each other and hit by the multiple, multiple economical crises, like now the, uh, the pandemic. The second factor after this ownership structure thing is that the, the public broadcasting com companies in Hungary funded by uh, Hungarian taxpayers uh, for millions, uh, for, for a couple of uh, hundred million US dollars are basically a mouthpiece for the government. Seven TV broadcasters and five radio channels belong to the public broadcasting conglomerate. Um, and, um, and, and there is only one large uh, Hungarian news agency uh, which basically cover um, mostly uh, the narratives of, of the government. And uh, the, the third factor, which is which could be important to mention, that uh, we have a very unique thing, I think, in all over the world, that, that several hundred private media outlets are concentrated in a centrally managed foundation called Central European Press and Media Foundation. It's an institution which is supposed to be independent because it's a foundation, but it's not. It's an in institution with a pronounced government bias. Uh, this foundation is classified as a matter of national strategic interest by the government. Uh, it was established three or four years ago, and its, its portfolio includes TV channels, radio stations, online news sites, tabloids, uh, and, and, and I think all county daily, so uh, all of the print media uh, outside of the capital. Uh, and there has been no such media holding in Hungary since the communist era. And the level of concentration and, and this, this model at all, that the foundation will have around 500 media products which are operated centrally is unprecedented. In, in the country and in Europe, and I think <laughs> in all over the world. The fourth factor is, 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 is also uh, regarding the media sphere business background, because the advertisement market in Hungary is also heavily influenced by, the polit by politics, because one of the biggest players in the advertisement market is the Hungarian state itself. And those with, who are sympathetic to the administration are allocated advertising, state advertising. But the others, uh, which classified as hostile, are excluded. And as a result, they or we can be, barely keep their heads above the water. And the fifth, uh, fifth factor, which, which, is the, which, which, uh, which is the most important in my life, in my everyday life, is the problem that Valerie also mentioned, the access to information. Uh, in Hungary, the situation is, is not that bad than, than in Russia. For example, journalists do not go to prison and there have been no murders of journalists in recent memory, luckily. But yet the work of the independent journalists has rarely been more difficult. We do not really just have to struggle to maintain the economic basis for our work, but we also have to fight for access to information. We're usually running up against brick walls when making inquiries to the public interest interviews uh, and, and not getting answers to our questions uh, from uh, by authorities is it's part, part of the course, which is really frustrating. Uh, so not only is the Hungarian um, press currently experiencing pain, painful cutbacks, but the ability of people in Hungary to access to information is also being increasingly impaired. 
because this shrinking, shrinking media space is limiting the freedom for all of us in this country as, and, and, and in my opinion, it's, it's weakening the democracy. So that's why we, we, uh, we started Telex uh, uh, after uh, all of, with, with all of my colleagues, we needed to left our previous workplace index uh, when, when uh, there were some external political influence on the newspaper. And on a single day, all of us, like 90 of us, decided to quit. So in a nutshell, <laughs> uh, I think uh, uh, there will be pretty much a lot of questions uh, regarding uh, the Hungarian example, because uh, I think it's a really important case. So I'm, I'm looking for, for them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Veronica. And we are all, the, the three of us, have been very much influenced by your work. And um, Veronica didn't mention that, but Telex was um, was started a month after they quit, which I think is just incredibly um, impressive. Actually, nine but, weeks, nine weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thank you so much. And we're moving to Paulina Milewska, our third speaker. Thank you very much, Ada, for inviting me here. And uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to be in an all-female panel for the first time in my life, same as for Veronica and Valerie. So um, to start with the um, Polish situation and, and the situation in Poland of uh, media outlets, it, it is very important to un underline that um, the situation there is still quite different from this in Russia and the situation in Hungary because still 80% of the media outlets are independent uh, and it's uh, not because of the lack of the um, energy on the side of the law and justice, the, the ruling party. Uh, it's more because of the fact that Poland is quite a big country, it's 37 millions of people and also mo most of the uh, media outlets were privately owned. So let's start with the chronology uh, of what happened in Poland. In 2015, the Law and Justice, the, the party which is ruling right now, with its leader Jarosław Kaczyński came to power and from that moment exactly, uh, our um, media uh, media outlets independence started to uh, to be undermined. So they first um, took over the um, public uh, broadcaster Telewizja Polska. They changed the head of the um, Telewizja Polska. They fired most of the editors, most of the journalists. Some of them quit because they basically changed Telewizja Polska into the propaganda tool. It's very important because um, in such a huge country as Poland, Telewizja Polska is this, um, this channel, which is getting to every, basically every house and every place in Poland. So even if you are in a very remote uh, village, you, can still have, uh, you still can have Telewizja Polska. Later, they, Law and Justice and Jarosław Kaczyński, they knew that it's not enough to um, just stay, uh, take over Telewizja Polska. Jarosław Kaczyński wanted to have, um, as he said, Budapest in Poland. So they started to intimidate um, independent, out independent outlets in different ways. They started to target them with uh, so-called slaps, so strategic lawsuits against public participation. Right now, Gazeta Wyborcza, uh, the main, uh, the biggest uh, high quality daily in Poland, has uh, more than 70 open cases against it. All of them issued by um, state owned companies, by different politicians, by uh, Telewizja Polska. So they have to struggle with all of these cases. And it's not the example only of Gazeta Wyborcza. All of the major independent news media in Poland are struggling with slap cases. Uh, another way of undermining um, the um, independent media in Poland was of course taking um, away the advertising of the state-owned companies. So from one day to another, all of them, um, 
high quality media, a media lost this kind of advertising, which was quite a significant revenue, especially for the newspapers. And additionally, all of these uh, state-owned companies and institution canceled their subscription. So that was the new reality that the um, uh, that independent new, uh, media outlets had to deal with. Additionally, even during the COVID crisis, so that's a moment that we are thinking that it's a moment of uh, a national unity. We are all fighting with the pandemic. The uh, governing party decided that Gazeta Wyborcza will be the only newspaper which didn't get the uh, um, information about uh, the COVID pandemic um, being printed in it, which was funded by the Ministry of Health. Um, another important step toward destroying the freedom of press in Poland was taking over of Polska Press by the big state-owned oil company Orlen. They bought it from the German publisher, and right now um, they are uh, they are basically influencing the uh, seven daily newspapers, twelve magazines, and over five hundred uh, web uh, news websites which are um, being read by, by 70 millions of viewers. So, and additionally to that, um, Orlen bought all of them, um, bought 65% of shares in the kiosks where the newspapers are being distributed. So that also canceled from all of this kiosk, Gazeta Wyborcza from, uh, from all, uh, um, or over, or over Poland. Additionally, what, what just happened recently is um, the whole campaign against the VN, uh, which is an independent uh, news channel, uh, which is owned by the American company Discovery. So basically, law and justice wanted to change the law in the way that um, a company which is not from the European economic area can uh, own um, majority shares in a in TV station. In that way, uh, Discovery would be would be forced to sell. Um, that led to international uh, protests, uh, quite a um, strong uh, response from the American diplomacy. In the end, Polish President Andrzej Duda vetoed this um, this bill, but we uh, we won't know what will happen in the future. Um, another crisis, ju just a recent one, was when the media outlets and journalists were banned from um, uh, from reporting from the Polish border during the refugee um, uh, refugee crisis that is happening there right now. It uh, basically um, it, it basically made uh, it impossible to show the situation to uh, to be sure what is happening there. It made the uh, public uh, just uh, uh, just to just rely on whatever Belarusian government or Polish government is showing. Uh, to not make my uh, my speech longer, as there will be. A lot of questions. I'm sure I would just like to underline that to um, to save the media, to save the independent media in such countries as Poland and uh, Hungary and Russia, it's essential to buy the subscription, to support uh, media, uh, small media outlets there, to support the journalists. And if that's not possible, then it's important to support the international uh, organizations which are supporting journalists and media outlets there. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Paulina, for such an insightful and clear presentation. And we will now move to the panel discussion. Um, I will be directing my questions at individual speakers, but if there's anything that you would like to add after the person has finished answering the question, please go ahead. And um, yes, the, the first question will be directed to Valerie. Um, and it concerns something that is on the front pages of news everywhere, uh, meaning the, pot the potential invasion on Ukraine. Um, and we know that the Russian state-owned um, state media played a key role in spreading anti-Ukrainian propaganda, which helped to raise support for the 2014 invasion. And I'm just wondering 
if history will repeat itself today, or do you think that Russians are just too disillusioned after years of military presence in Ukraine? Well, thank you, Ada. That's a great question. I can preview a story I have coming out possibly tomorrow, uh, precisely about this topic. Um, and uh, I happen to spend a lot of time recently watching state-owned media, which is something that most of my friends in Moscow prefer to avoid. <laughs> um, and especially some of the sort of major agenda setting news shows and talk shows. Um, and I think that, you know, this increase, this troop increase and, and this rise in tension is I think being experienced in a lot of ways quite differently than, than 2014 uh, because precisely of the context that, that I started talking about before uh, in the sense that uh, in 2014, despite the fact that Crimea is a very popular destination with many Russians, that many Russians grew up going there, always sort of felt that like it was theirs, um, you know, and, and many of them don't necessarily dispute uh, Russian possession of Crimea while um, while they did, wouldn't put such a claim on parts of eastern Ukraine, for instance, where Russian-backed separatists are, are fighting now. Um, there was 50,000 people in the streets protesting in March 2014. Um, and now what we've seen is a petition by prominent intellectuals that's been signed by, I think I checked today, 5,000 people. So it, it, you know, the repression, it's a combination, I think, of, 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 of ongoing and deepening repression on civil society, on protesters and activists, combined with rules and regulations that have been put in place since the pandemic, um, and sort of an, an endless onslaught of messaging from uh, public television channels um, that has by and large set the agenda. I mean, uh, polling from what I've seen, you know, many Russians are are scared of a war, um, even not necessarily going to come to them on Russian territory, but, you know, whether they have family or friends in Ukraine or lived there themselves. Uh, but almost all of it see it as a provocation that's been organized and pumped up by America. Um, and what we can see from the news has been very much, you know, constant um, uh, different segments. I watched on Sunday night, uh, the show hosted by Kiselyov, which was quite ominous. He sort of alluded to the outbreak of the war, uh, the 2008 Russian war with Georgia, which also uh, started when Putin was at the Olympics, guess where, in Beijing. Um, and he's, the whole segment that he did was about deja vu. And then uh, that led into an, a discussion of Americans breaking their promises um, in terms of NATO expansion, you know, the, a, a sort of false thesis that America promised never to expand NATO uh, beyond East Berlin. Um, and then the next show, Moscow Kremlin Putin, uh, also focused, uh, you know, did an hour of Americans breaking their promises or disrespecting Russia. So it's for sure um, whipping up frustration with the West in, in, with a view to blaming it. And as I said, you know, it's very difficult to, um, it's difficult for many Russians to get access to impartial media at this point, especially outside of Moscow or whether they whether they choose to hear it or not. But at the same time, um, there's another there's another force at bay, which I think is also very true in, in Poland and Hungary and elsewhere in the region, which is apathy. Uh, one sociologist that, that my colleague spoke to said, you know, that he estimated that about 40 percent of the population was had just sort of put up their hands, was apathetic definitely not interested in watching, you know, what they saw as propaganda coming from the state TV, but also really uninterested um, in, in seeking further information and really disappointed um, uh, with, uh, with the politics in general. And the third group that, you know, uh, we also spoke to was somebody who really didn't like what Putin is doing at home, but I don't know if this is a result of, of he, you know, he doesn't watch state TV, but still felt 
that um, that the military buildup was certainly the fault of the US and that Putin is protecting Russia's foreign policy interests. So again, um, I think this, this decades long now, lack of access to independent media is you know, shaping an entire worldview in ways that will have consequences now for, for, for years and decades to come. Thank you so much. Um, the next question will be directed at Veronica. Um, is it possible for journalists and media outlets to stay objective under an authoritarian regime? And I'm asking this because from my point of view as a Polish journalist, mostly working in Poland, I do feel that independent journalism in my, in my country is often taking the form of, an, especially opinion journalism, it's like taking the form of an an anti-government activism these days. And I find, it qu find that quite frightening. Yeah, thank you. It's a really, really good question. And, and uh, there are a lot of discussion uh, about the same thing uh, with my co-journalists, uh, co uh, with my colleagues in my country. Uh, but my opinion is, and uh, that I passionately believe in, that is necessary to remain impartial. Uh, and as I mentioned, it is a constant debate. Uh, uh, it's better a better strategy to use activist journalism in to be oppositional journalist, and, but I hate the term. So, uh, and I, uh, if, if in Hungary, if you are not a pro-governmental journalist, uh, just because of your existence, you are being labeled as an oppositional one. But I always refuse uh, the, this label because I believe that every journalist accord, uh, need to need to play uh, uh, with, uh, with the with the traditional rules rules of of this profession, and I believe that every journalist's duty is to report objectively and to present information as detailed as possible and as from and and present it as many angles uh, as possible and the readers or the audience will decide how he or she create their opinion about any subject so i don't think that it's it's a, it's the function of the journalists or uh, or or uh, the function of uh, of the of the news media, which is my uh, field, uh, to 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 form uh, political uh, opinions in in news pieces. Of course, there are opinion pieces which is create for that and help uh, people um, create their own um, own opinions and own attitudes to towards very different kind of phenomena and things in the world. But, uh, but I strongly believe that impartiality and objectivity is a key, key factor uh, for, for journalists to do their jobs. Yeah, I agree so much with you. And I feel like if once we lose that, we start playing by their rules in a sense, right? And that yeah. only worsens the pro the problem. Um, yeah, but if I just can, if I if I am sure. allowed to make one more short uh, comment, that uh, uh, it's really really difficult uh, to to keep uh, uh, these rules uh, in in a in a political scene like the Hungarian because our job is to ask questions and it, and if we cannot get answers from the authorities and from the political actors. It's really hard to to present the facts in their whole um, um, in the whole picture. So so yeah, the job to be objective, but the tools are <laughs> are not really easy to do these days. Yeah, I get that, and also I and I also I, I kind of understand the arguments of the other side, which are that you know since in Poland or Hungary or Russia, of course we no longer have full democracy or full media freedom. It's kind of like a moment when all hands should be on board and you know we can sometimes become activists as journalists. Um, I don't subscribe to that view, but I can see the benefits of it as well. 
So my next question is directed to Paulina. Uh, you mentioned that soon after the outbreak of the humanitarian crisis on the border with Belarus, the government banned the media from entering the border region and reporting there. And so I was wondering, you know, how did the journalists deal with that? Because we did get some coverage in the end. It was not full coverage. It's not what we would have, would have wanted, but we did see something. And I'm just wondering, you know, what sort of methods did they use? What sort of coverage did we get? So uh, for, from what I know from my friends, some uh, who are journalists, some of them were um, uh, entering the, the area anyway. The, for, the area that uh, journalists couldn't get into was the three kilometers um, uh, wide, but it was like uh, this uh, special um, place that journalists couldn't enter was uh, footed all along the Belarusian border. So it was 300 kilometers uh, long and uh, three kil kilometers wide. Of course, like some people would argue, oh, it's not, not such, a, a, such a, hu a huge piece of, um, um, of uh, part of Poland, they uh, the journalists couldn't enter. But of course, during, during this crisis and during this situation, that was the, the place where, for example, journalists couldn't, um, uh, couldn't be witnesses of the illegal push, uh, pushbacks of which the Polish government was, uh, was accused of. Um, so whenever the journalist was caught uh, within this area, um, he or she could, uh, could get um, up to 5,000 zloty of, uh, of a fine, which is around uh, $1,300. Or um, this person could end up even up to uh, for 30, 30 days in jail. Uh, I didn't hear about uh, any type of, uh, of, uh, of jail uh, verdicts, but uh, for sure the fines were, were um, uh, were decided for some of the journalists. Right. Um, and um, Valerie, you mentioned a wide array of, rep of repressions, uh, repressive measures that uh, journalists faced face in Russia. And I was just wondering if those sort of, sort of measures also influence your work as a foreign correspondent and, you know, how, how do you deal with access to information, for example, in your daily work? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, uh, certainly it influences my work, as, as Veronica said, that uh, it's not like you can waltz into the Kremlin and, and have a have a tete a tete with with a high level official. Um, it's not like you can even go to a security conference. Um, and and even you know have access to some of the people who are expressing themselves and they're thinking you know the the Russian worldview and the Russian perspective on politics even if you're just trying to understand them there's such a mistrust of the press um, that that's quite difficult but in terms of what I write it, sure it 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 doesn't affect me if if other than to always keep me on my toes and make sure that we are always, you know, following the most important fundamental rules of journalism. You have to ask, you know, try as best as you can to understand a perspective, even if, even if people sitting in the government or close to them don't want to share it to you. I get a comment. Um, make sure that everything is as tight as possible, because if you do make a mistake, there will be repercussions. Um, and I think that you know, from that perspective, I mean, if you make a mistake uh, in a Western media context, of course, you know, your credibility is at stake or readers may not trust your byline or your paper. Um, but certainly, of course, here you may face more consequences. But at the same time, uh, from another perspective, there can be arbitrary things. You know, I mentioned these two journalists from the BBC and from a Dutch newspaper, the Volkrant, who were who were pushed out. It wasn't really necessarily about them. It was it was geopolitics um, and what's happening to the Deutsche Welle. What may happen? We still don't know that Deutsche Welle has vowed to stay and continue their work. Um, that's again, you know, nothing to do with their journalism. So yes, I think for some people it might 
hang over their heads, but I haven't met anyone that lets it affect the, the quality of their reporting. If anything, as I said, it's just more difficult to find people who are inside of the government and inside of the system who are willing to share with you their their honest opinions and worldviews and and sort of elucidate that for you. I think that's also a function of of spending a long time here, you know, cultivating sources. Um, uh, you know, and yeah, I don't know. Does that answer the question? Definitely. Thank you so much. Um, Veronica, I'm wondering about, you know, how, because we know that the pandemic, that the government in Hungary used the pandemic as a pretext for extending its hegemony over the media market. And I'm wondering, you know, that has happened in government, with governments across the world, and we've seen them imposing excessive surveillance. Uh, actually, I, I, I lost Ada. I'm not sure that it's, it's a problem with my connection or, or it's Oh, hers. no, I thought it was me, but I guess it's hers. Oh, oh dear. No, it's same here. Why don't you start answering the question, Paulina, <laughs> since it was directed to you, right? I'm not sure what the question was. It was how the government uh, using the COVID situation as a pretext, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a great question also for Hungary and, and Poland. <laughs> Yeah. About the uh, okay. Still, while while still are waiting for Ada, uh, I I start to answer from the Hungarian perspective, and then I I pass the ball to Paulina because I think in Poland it's also <laughs> it's also uh, an important factor uh, to discuss. Uh, well, uh, yes, it it of course. It was it was a really important factor in my country, and there were some new laws implemented uh, just because the COVID situation. It was called emer emergency uh, laws that that basically the state uh, has larger uh, can have can have la larger influence on basically everything what's happening in the country, and uh, and the law extended it to to um, to journalism as well, uh, according uh, to the text of the law, it was it was supposed to uh, to ex to expel fake news uh, from from social media, uh, but uh, but it it could could have been used against journalists as well, um, which never happened. So uh, according to the law, they could. You, they could have used it uh, as um, um, as a very very um, a serious restriction, but it's never happened. But what I experienced that uh, that when I uh, used to work at Index and and the political influence started to happen around the newspaper, uh, the pretext was the COVID situation, and the pretext was that that. That okay, we need to make some changes at Index, which was the largest, most influential, most known uh, general interest news daily in the country. And they said that okay, here is this horrible financial situation because of the COVID. So we need to make some changes. We need to restructure uh, the the editorial staff. And and in the end, they fired the editor in chief. Uh, so. So I experienced that uh, somehow, uh, not directly, but either uh, indirectly, uh, politics used COVID uh, when they when they uh, uh, decided to to finish uh, uh, the existence of index as it used to exist. I don't know if I answered the question or not. And I think Ada is, is, is with us again. Yes, I'm so sorry. I lost connection for a second. I hope you can hear me well now. Yeah, don't worry. I answered your question actually yeah, <laughs> while I you could, were away. <laughs> I could hear that. Thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna, my last question in the panel is directed at Polina and um, it may sound a bit grim, but I, I feel like I need to ask that. Um, 
well, the autocratic assault on media freedom is part of a larger trend, as we all know. Um, the fact that democracy is in decline worldwide. According to the 2021 Freedom House report, this democracy gap has been de deepening for the past 15 years. And today, nearly 75% of the world population lives in a country that faced deterioration last year. So faced with such grim statistics, I wonder, can freedom of the press be saved at all? That's a complicated question. And of course, uh, with uh, all of the broad and complicated questions, you don't have one right answer. For sure, what we can do as, um, as uh, citizens, we can sub uh, subscribe to different uh, media outlets. We can pay for the subscription. We can donate for the uh, journalist, uh, journalistic organizations. That's what we can do from our level. What are the different solutions that uh, depends on the European Union, on different governments, because um, it's impossible overnight to create the revenue and money are very important when it comes to uh, newspapers and to paying for journalists that were lost over uh, Google and over Facebook and over the ad advertisement shift that happened back then. It's hard to think about new business models after uh, what happened with the printed uh, newspapers and uh, with the switch to the internet. So it's quite complicated and uh, different um, uh, journalistic associations and also newspapers themselves, they are arguing, for example, for um, creating a law under which the European Co uh, Commission would be um, would always have to pay for some advertisement in the high quality media in different European Union member states. That's one idea for a solution. Another idea is uh, what if all of the um, media outlets would be a foundations and then they could um, apply for grants instead of being the um, the share uh, the um, the companies with. Uh, share owners, which made uh, make it impossible to um, to look for another money than the money from selling newspapers. So it's complicated, and on the EU level, it's something that uh, the Commission um, can see, and um, um, especially uh, Vera Europa is very active when it comes to the protection of journalists and uh, trying to to think about the future of. Um, of uh, media um, at the same time thinking about the future of the European Union because of the without the high quality media outlets without the journalists it's hard to to sustain uh, such an important and uh, and uh, amazing project which is the European Union itself I'm not sure if it answers your question but I, I'm afraid there is no, no, not a good answer to that question right now. We can discuss and speculate and try and try and try because we have to do something to save the media. Absolutely, and all of the recommendations you've given us are extremely important, and I'm so I'm so grateful for you to mention that. Um, well, we're going to move to the Q and A part of the session right now because we've received some really great questions from the audience. Thank you so much um, for, the, for them. Um, the first one, using the opportunity that this is an all-female panel, it would be interesting to learn if female journalists are affected by the current challenges to press freedom in a different way than their male counterparts. What do you think, guys? Uh, well, I, I can start uh, if, if that's okay. Uh, I think it's harder for female journalists uh, because uh, I don't know what's the situation in Russia and in Poland, but in Hungary, I don't have a content analysis for that. And there were no research regarding how female journalists are being bullied in this country. But according to my uh, observations, so to say, <laughs> and my experiences, uh, in my in my uh, Facebook account and in Messenger and 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 in other public uh, comment sections, 
Uh, and, and so as my female colleagues, political reporters and economical reporters at Telex, uh, we all experienced quite harsh bullying in the last couple of years, especially since uh, the Hungarian government started to, not directly, it's always need to be emphasized that it's never directly, but there are some organizations which have quite close connections to the government and they create uh, I call them political influencers, uh, people whose only job to be present in the social media uh, and, and basically their job is to be a megaphone of the governmental narrative and their other task is basically to, to bullying uh, critical journalists or undermining their, their positions in the public sphere. And according to my observations, female journalists get more from them. Right. There are also statistics show, sorry, I think I'm muted. Um, there are also statistics showing that actually female journalists are more prone to online harassment than male journalists, that it happens more often. Um, the next question, uh, there was a really funny comment. Somebody asked that the Russian government just disconnected one of the panelists. No, I'm afraid it's my internet, <laughs> but who knows? Um, so the next question is from uh, Gregory Missioner. Um, I, am a prof I am a professor from Brazil and a visiting scholar at MIT Polisci. As a Latin Americanist and one of the um, and as a Latin Americanist, many of the themes covered by the panelists, such as concentration of media and hands of pro government, manipulation of public advertising, and lack of access to information, sound very very familiar. Um, so support for independent outlets such as Telex is critical. Do the panelists see a strong support for such outlets from where um, coming from international agents such as foundations? and domestic elites and where? Uh, telex have micro donations from a couple of tens of thousands of Hungarians basically. So we do not have a large amount of money from, from international uh, sources. Our major, uh, the majority of our revenue stream is coming from the readers. Telex is based, start launched slowly based on crowdfunding. Now uh, we have uh, a lot, the majority of our income from the readers and the minority is coming from advertisement, but those are micro donations. So we do not have very rich people uh, to give a loads of money. So guys in the audience, if you, if you know <laughs> such people, please recommend them Telex, which is, which is an important cause to, to support. Right. If I may just add, the uh, situation in Poland is similar. There is one uh, media outlet, Okopress, which is fully uh, sponsored by the readers. It was a great success that something like that uh, was able to, to be sustained in Poland as it was created just in 2015. And when it comes to Gazeta Wyborcza, it's subscription, advertisement, also very big private donors and small donors that, that want to just do something more than, uh, than buy the subscription. Um, the next, oh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I just wanna say in Russia, there's a, a big phenomenon because you know the space is so small. It's um, a lot of people have actually gone to YouTube um, and other outlets like that, but mainly YouTube, to kind of try to survive on a combination of donations from viewers and ad revenue. Um, but it's also very interesting that because the content is produced here in Russia, the ad revenue that producers receive is actually much lower due to the way that YouTube remunerates people. I don't know if, if um, Veronica, you have this issue and we don't need to go deep into the way that American tech companies are, are affecting this. But um, that also makes me concerned though that um, you know Russia has increased its 
uh, criticism of YouTube in recent months, especially after YouTube removed uh, two of Russia RT German channels uh, last September over misinformation claims. So um, that's a big way that, that independent journalists and voices are funding themselves here, but it may be another avenue that's closed uh, before long. And one of the readers is asking a follow-up question on that. Uh, what is the price point for subscriptions? How much are people willing to pay for good journalism? In Hungary, the average is uh, like seven to 10 US dollars a, a month. Okay. So I don't think that's, that's, too, that's very expensive. I think Hungarians just realized this year that they need to contribute financially if they, con if they would like to consume fact-based quality journalism. And it's enough. I mean, we have like 50,000 uh, 50, yeah, 50, uh, readers who ever contributed financially to Telex. And, uh, and it's sustainable with these numbers. So it can be done. That's, that's my optimistic side. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's possible uh, to, to make a, a newspaper with a large newsroom because Telex has around 80 journalists. Uh, so we are one of the largest newsrooms in the country uh, to, to, to make it happen sustainably with this hybrid model, uh, readers revenue and advertisement. Um, there's a question for Valerie. What accounts for people's apathy in Russia? And then is the same phenomena, phenomenon also happening in Poland and Hungary? I'll try to answer briefly since we are running out of time. I think we could have a whole like 50,000 panel discussions about this topic. I think it's quite difficult. I think I listened to a sociologist recently on Echo Moskvi, the one sort of liberal leaning um, radio station that's also partially owned by Gazprom Media, one of the biggest media conglomerates owned by um, Gazprom, which is an uh, oil and gas company. Um, and his assessment was that it's A, the fear of, of uh, jail and repression, and B, uh, a, a certain sense of a certain resigned sense that whatever you do, you won't have any effect on the outcome. So why bother trying, I think, uh, is what a lot of it boils down to. I think it's that that sense of complete lack of, I guess, what in political science is called external efficacy. No, political science professors on here, correct me if I'm wrong, please. Um, but uh, yeah, this, uh, this belief that no matter what you do, you can't change anything. And, and a lot of friends, a lot of people I know in my sort of, you know, liberal bubble, educated, who speak English, they just sort of, you know, they, they're aware of what's going on, but they're not actively seeking out the news because they really want to tune it out. And otherwise it's too, it's just too upsetting. And it's too absurd. So many things like also from three years in Hungary, like so much stuff that you see in like main government, pro-government media outlets, it's just absurd. Like sometimes it's funny, but sometimes it just makes you want to cry. So I think people don't want to expose themselves to that. If my, I may uh, jump in, uh... So I wouldn't say that we, we are dealing with a lot of apathy in Poland. Poland is a strongly um, polarized country, which is uh, more like split is 50-50. So like 49% uh, uh, of the voters is vo voting for the oppositionist party or the opposition uh, candidate for the president. Also in Poland, we, we are having quite a lot of protests, anti-governmental protests, uh, protests which are, uh, which, are, um, which are the answer for their anti-abortion law, which are the answer for uh, them trying to, um, um, to do different things with the TVN. So there are protests, the protests are huge, but still the problem with the media is that um, what is happening with them is sometimes happening with a lot of small steps. So it's not like a one super um, super quick hit at all of the media outlets. It's like one small administrative law uh, uh, after another. And let's be honest, when there is a lot of stuff in general going on with a lot of institution with, uh, with like reproductive rights, that is something that I would say 
um, is the least appealing to people to, to protest about. So that's the problem that I see. Yeah, Maria Ressa, the Nobel Peace Prize recipient, called that a death by a thousand cuts, you know, in the sense that the auto autocratic assault doesn't come all at once like a hurricane. It's usually a very gradual process in which sometimes it's, it's hard to be aware of it while it's happening. Um, I have a question actually to my panelists. Are we okay to um, stay for five or 10 minutes tops to just answer all of the questions that the audience has asked? Great, wonderful. Um, so the next one um, from Sean Walker. In both Poland and Hungary, the governments claimed that before we came to power, it was, it was the same, but the other way around, claiming the opposition when in power also had their own pet media outlets. Clearly this is an exaggeration, but is there any truth to it at all? And, and did this help in some way to erode trust in the media in general? Thank you for a great question, by the way. Yeah, it's a great question. Hi, hi, Sean. Um, uh, in terms of Hungary, as I mentioned, I have been a journalist in the last 20 years. So I, I was already a journalist when, when different governments uh, ruled the country. And I was a journalist when the previous Fidesz government uh, ruled the country. So I could see the difference. And, uh, uh, and yeah, there might be some, some uh, some uh, right uh, uh, basis of this narrative uh, that the previous liberal uh, socialist government had had their their pet media. But what I experienced as a journalist that that uh, before uh, in the first ten years of my my political uh, career, I got answers for my questions, you know, and I, I didn't really care who the owners are uh, above my head and, and in, in other, other media outlets, because it, that, it didn't matter because, because media owners never really um, um, influenced the content and influenced the, the staff members of of the newspapers and uh, and and if I call the ministry with some important questions, public interest uh, regarding any public interest stories that I I got answers on the same day and uh, and and it changed <laughs> and it changed dramatically, not quickly, uh, but but through through the last decade basically basically access to information. I would not say this disappeared because we do have some possibilities and opportunities to to make connections uh, to the politicians and authorities, but uh, it became extremely hard to to fulfill our our uh, our jobs as journalists. Thank you so much. Um, there is a question directed to Valerie from Lidio Nikolescu. I'm sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Um, can Valerie tell us how hard or easy it is to interview people in Russia? Are many willing to go on record? Are many interested in talking with you? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, I want to repeat that I'm still a bit new here and there's a pandemic. So I don't know, Olivia, if you mean like high level officials or if you mean ordinary people. Um, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, um, I'm very shy sometimes. I don't like to do box pop, but but in general, you know, people do speak to us. Um, I think it's not how, how can I put it like we can request an interview and oh you know it can take some time or sometimes you know it can take some time to get a statement but I don't want to um I want to be fair actually to you know the 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 government interviews that I've sought which are not so many I, I've gotten um maybe they were on zoom or maybe it took a week or 10 days to organize but um but I think it's still possible, but I think it's a, it's a, that's partially because of the incredible privilege that I have to work for the New York Times. Um, but uh, as I said, I don't know exactly what level of people that you meant, but, but there are certainly people who would mistrust us or, or not like us. You know, the pandemic, of course, provides, um, provides a different level of um, 
you know, it provides a plausible denial, plausible reason not to have a meeting. Um, I, I, I think it was hard in Hungary as well. You know, I think I interviewed all of two ministers in the three years that I lived there. Um, and that, that's also quite difficult. I mean, the fine, I worked for the Financial Times and I couldn't meet the finance minister. Um, the foreign minister preferred to do interviews in, um, in Washington or New York with colleagues that weren't locally based. And I think you can see, you'll see that a lot because people are keen to have media exposure, but not necessarily if they're going to be asked really hard questions. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, another question is from an anonymous uh, member of the audience. Uh, and I think it's, yeah, it's directed to Paulina. Is the oil slash gas, gas company Orlan a government sponsored slash owned company? If Orlan purchases the media site of a German publishing company, how does that lead to media oppression in Poland? If Orlan is not a government owned company, don't the editors have the right to, the right to write whatever they want? Would that be any different than, let's say, Jeff, Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post? Would that mean that he is in some, um, in some way manipulating facts to fit his political viewpoint. That's really interesting. So uh, Orlan is a state-owned company and also it's important to understand that in Poland the heads of the state-owned companies are elected by the governing uh, party, the governing co coalition. So basically the head of Orlan company, da uh, Daniel Obajtek, uh, is um, he's described as the protege of Jarosław Kaczyński, the head of the law and justice. And because in Poland, it's different than in Hungary. We don't have a lot of um, oligarch business people who are uh, connected to the ruling party. The law and justice basically decided to do similar thing that Orban did with uh, media in, in Hungary, but uh, to use uh, state-owned companies and as the Orlan is the biggest and the wealthiest state-owned company that was the in a way natural choice uh, to use and of course we can argue that uh, it's a company it can be state-owned that the media are just the business so they should be independent but uh, of course it doesn't work like that so after buying the um, after buying the Polska Press, they, they just changed a lot of the editors in chief of this uh, local newspapers, of this local ma magazines. Also, there is the chilling effect because everyone knows what happened in the uh, uh, in Telewizja Polska. If you don't want to lose your job, you are thinking twice uh, about writing something negative about law and justice and uh, Jarosław Kaczyński. And we have to remember that uh, even like the work of the journalist is quite precarious right now in Poland. And in Warsaw, you can find a new job for a different uh, media outlet. But if you work in a, a smaller uh, city or, uh, or like middle sized town, like let's say Rzeszu, you, you just have like one place where you can work. So if you will be fired after 20 years of working for this uh, newspaper or magazine that belongs to Polska Press and you have a family, you have a mortgage, etc. what will you do with yourself? So it's not, sometimes they even don't have to say something directly to, to introduce the effect they want to achieve. I hope that's answered, that's answered the question. Thank you for such an insightful answer. Um, then there is a question from Chapel Lawson. Um, what is the level of journalistic corruption in Russia, Hungary, and Poland, meaning both pro-regime and anti-regime outlets? Anybody want to take that? <laughs> I would say like it's a, it's a difficult question. And to be honest, I don't have any data on that. Um, I would be happy to uh, research it and, you know, get back to you after the panel because immediately nothing comes to comes to my mind in terms of um you know corruption in poland and journalistic corruption it depends how we define corruption and uh, what do you mean by corruption because i wouldn't say that a classical corruption like paying a journalist to write an article or not write an article is uh, is the way uh, it's the something that uh, occurs a lot in Poland, 
but if you mean by corruption, being happy to write whatever uh, law and justice would, would like uh, some journalist to write and then being sure that you will get uh, state advertisement, that you will get uh, financial support for your outlet, then we can see that a lot on the, uh, on the, um, pro in the pro-governmental media. Yeah, as I also mentioned, the pro-governmental media scene uh, have a lot of money allocated from the state. So, but it's not uh, par excellence corruption. It's 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 the legal way to to finance media and and to reach the situation that uh, that millions of people can have the narratives uh, through uh, out media outlets and social media actors. Uh, uh, to 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 consume the one-sided uh, reality uh, of the things. Uh, so yeah, corruption can mean a lot of things. But if if uh, uh, the if if you mean that that in in an envelope you get money, it's not really um, common in Hungary. But the state organized version. <laughs> Um, and the last question, because we need to be wrapping up, uh, comes from William Franks. Uh, he's asking, in Russia during communist times, um, Zendat, which were copied books and magazines circulated by hand amongst friends and colleagues. Are there such efforts currently in Russia or Poland or Hungary? Mm, I can start. Um, I, I guess this is some is that. Um, and I think, you know, we live in a totally different period of social media, which is why we see, you know, different attempts to, to crack down on social media um, more than more than more than a need for for spreading, covertly spreading information. Um, but uh, I think this is certainly why um, Russian government has been trying to take a stronger line against Facebook. Russian government has been trying to get, you know, for instance, um, the app store to um, to remove apps, for instance, on election day in September um, or just before election day, uh, the Russian government requested that, that the app stores of Google and um, iPhones remove apps that were a smart voting app for Navalny. So, the, I mean, this is not some is that, this is not a, a fake information, but these were, uh, this was an app where uh, people who were in favor of the opposition movement led by uh, Alexei Navalny, who's now in jail, uh, could figure out like, which who to vote for that would would minimize maybe you know to oppose Putin and try to do a joint opposition the way that Hungary has united. I do actually think there is one Samizdat outlet in Hungary that is um, print, being printed and delivering. It's small scale though to to and I wanted to do a story about it before I left, but maybe Veronica can tell us about it. Yeah, it's not the, the real Samizda that it used to be in the communist era, but there is one version of printed these leaflets that the English were writing. Uh, and this is a smaller group of people who uh, basically pick uh, news stories uh, from independent online outlets. They print it and they, they take it to smaller villages, to people who do not consume uh, their news through online. Uh, so that's how they can get um, critical independent news, because if they consume it through their county dailies or through radio or through the state television, they will only have one narrative. So this small group of people, uh, they call themselves which can be translated like uh, print it yourself. Uh, and and they print these 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 papers and they and they put it uh, uh, to the post box to to uh, elderly people in villages mainly, so they can get the news which is only online. If I can jump in, uh, in Poland we don't have uh, this kind of phenomena that happens regularly, but. Around the election, Gazeta Wyborcza was creating uh, a special edition that they were just taking to the smaller towns, to the 
villages and they were giving it for free with the articles about elections, about the government, etc. So in this way, they were trying at least to some small um, extent counter the narrative, uh, which is uh, channeled through the propaganda tube, which is basically Televizia Polska right now. Right. Well, thank you so much, um, guys, and thank you for joining us today to our um, audience from all over the world. Um, thank you to our sponsors. Um, please note that we have many upcoming events. Detail details are in the chat feature, and we hope to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.